Welcome to the fourth in my series of short podcasts about the stories of the Tudors. My name's Tony Riches and I'm an historical fiction author from Pembrokeshire in Wales and a specialist in the history of the early Tudors. In the previous podcast, I looked at the life of Jasper Tudor and how he helped make his nephew Henry Tudor the King of England. Henry's story is the subject of book three of the Tudor trilogy. After 14 years in exile, the 28-year-old Henry Tudor was not well prepared for the challenge of becoming king. It's easy to imagine him having mixed feelings on the eve of the Battle of Bosworth. He'd never commanded an army and he must have wondered if he had any chance as he sailed from France with just over 2,000 troops, most of them mercenaries who cared little really for his future. And on his long march to the Battle of Bosworth across Wales uh, from Mill Bay in Pembrokeshire, his numbers at least doubled, but without the support of the Stanley family, Um, Henry Tudor had less than 5,000 men and the army of Richard III might have been as many as 15,000. So Henry was outnumbered by around 3 to 1. If he lost, he could expect a traitor's death and must have wished he was back in Brittany. It was close and he watched Richard III's brave charge and saw his standard bearer Sir William Brandon fall mortally wounded. Then Richard was surrounded by the Welshmen of Resap Thomas and the tide of the battle turned because Sir William and Sir Thomas Stanley had been watching from the sidelines. Richard III had held Thomas Stanley's son Lord Strange hostage really to stop him from fighting for Henry and to encourage him to fight for the Yorkists. But with their private army of around 6,000 men, the brothers attacked Richard III's rear flank and the Yorkists were routed. After his victory at the Battle of Bosworth, Henry led a procession through the narrow streets of York where he was attacked by a man with a dagger. His bodyguard saved him, but his reign was nearly over before it began and he later travelled with 50 yeomen of the guard for his personal protection. I think he was always looking over his shoulder after that. And one thing Henry did understand uh, was how to win over the people. He didn't invent the Tudor rose, uh, but the, the combined red and white roses had long been known as the symbols of the Virgin, representing sacrifice and purity. But he cleverly adopted it as his brand and began replacing the White Rose of York with his own logo, if you like. His mother, Lady Margaret Beaufort, had already seen the opportunity to unite Lancaster and York through Henry's marriage to the beautiful young Elizabeth of York. It has been said that this was simply a marriage of convenience, but the evidence suggests that they did grow to love each other, and it was a happy marriage. Most importantly, their union gave the Yorkist lords a face-saving way to support the new king, as any successor would be at least half descended from the York line. Henry had also been described as mean and miserly, but his personal accounts show how he loved gambling with cards and dice, and in fact he lost huge sums more often than he won. He kept detailed records of who he'd played against, and that included his wife, Elizabeth of York. Some other strange things I discovered in my research were that, as well as lions and other dangerous animals, which he kept in the Tower of London, Henry had a pet monkey thought to be a little marmoset in his private chambers, and one day he discovered it had torn up his detailed diary, so there is actually a gap in his meticulous records. I also thought it odd when the pretender Perkin Warbeck was finally captured. Henley was uh, very fond of Warbeck's wife, Lady Catherine Gordon, and kept them both in his own household, but wouldn't let them sleep together. His accounts show that he bought Lady Catherine expensive dresses and gifts, and she became a close companion and confidant, even after Henry had her husband executed. 
The Tudor dynasty nearly came to an end at Christmas 1497 when Henry and his family were woken in the middle of the night by a raging fire in his private chambers at Sheen Palace. The fire burned out of control for over three hours, destroying almost the whole palace. His priceless tapestries were turned to ashes and most of his possessions were destroyed. The family barely escaped with their lives, but the old palace was ruined and Henry had it rebuilt at a cost of more than 60,000 ducats as the Palace of Richmond. Henry Tudor oversaw the longest period of relative peace for generations and left the treasurer of England in a much better state than he found it. Yet his time as king was marked with sadness. First, his eldest son, Arthur, died soon after his marriage. Then his wife, Elizabeth, died on her birthday soon after giving birth. Henry was never quite the same again, and I wonder what he would have said about his legacy if he'd known what sort of king his younger son, Henry, would turn out to be. My Tudor trilogy has become a bestseller in the UK, US and Australia, so I'd like to think that I've in some way helped to preserve the memory of this modest King of England. Last year, a group of us raised the money for a life-sized bronze statue of Henry Tudor to be placed in front of his birthplace at Pembroke Castle to ensure his contribution is not forgotten. I'd now like to share with you a sample of the audiobook edition of Henry, book three of the Tudor trilogy, narrated by James Young. Henry had a secret, a chilling truth only he would ever know. He'd never wanted to be king. He once tried to tell his uncle Jasper. Dismissing him with a laugh, Jasper risked their lives to make it happen. So Henry learned to live with his secret, which troubled his waking thoughts and haunted his dreams. He'd not believed it possible to become king of England. Too many stood in his path, and others waited for their chance. Given the chance, he would live out his days in the serene Brittany countryside. He remembered the sadness in the eyes of the beautiful Breton woman he would never see again. Even as he marched with his rebel army to Bosworth, he'd made his peace with God. Despite his faith, he feared a painful death and prayed it would be quick. The best he'd hoped for was imprisonment. He had been a prisoner of sorts for most of his 28 years, so it wouldn't have been so bad. Now he held the gold circlet. He could see it wasn't a proper crown, but a symbol of kingship made to fit over a sallet helmet. His finger traced the fresh, jagged scar in the soft metal. The force of the blow unhorsed the former owner, his enemy King Richard. Henry heard the king's defiant curse as he fell. An eerie quiet marked their victory, punctuated only by the groans of wounded and dying men. An English knight close to Henry called out, his powerful voice shattering the silence like the boom of a cannon. God save the king! God save King Henry! Henry turned to see his uncle join in with five thousand others. Jasper raised his sword high and shouted at the top of his voice. He no longer wore his helmet, and tears glistened on his weary face. God save King Henry! God save King Henry! God save King Henry! God save King Henry! Henry mounted his white charger and lifted the gold coronet in the air to a rousing cheer from the men. The sound echoed across the battlefield, startling black flapping crows from their gruesome task. God did little to save the last king. His body slung naked over a horse on its way to public display in Leicester. Henry said a silent prayer for guidance. He must rely on his faith even more now. He pushed his dark secret away, its power over him replaced by a new foreboding. Henry, book three of the Tudor trilogy, is available from Amazon and links to all of my books can be found on my website at tonyriches.com. The next podcast in the series will be the story of Henry's youngest daughter, Mary Tudor, 
who became Queen of France. Thank you for listening.